we go. We are live. Hi, um, this is the Webbing Show with Noel McDermott, and we've got Alex Friedman with us as well, and Angela, um, his partner in crime, will be joining us soon, but we're just having slight technical problems. Um, Alex and Angela have written uh, a fantastic child's book, The Big Thing. Is that correct? It's called The Big Thing, isn't it? Yep, The Big uh, Thing. Uh, oddly enough, I was asked to review um, as part of a news article. Um, and I read the book and they asked me to sort of read the book and comment on it. And I just fell in love with the book and I thought it was brilliant. Um, and so I got in touch with my team who helped sort out this show and said, um, can we get these people on? Can we get the authors of this book on? Um, and thankfully you readily agreed, which is fantastic. <laughs> Have a year. So um, we'll get into chatting a, a minute about um, about your book uh, and what it is. Um, and but first, I just want to sort of make sure that I do all the the appropriate welcomes to the show. So um, this is the Wellbeing Show, as I said. Uh, it's live and direct from London uh, on Wednesday, the twentieth of May at um, ten o'clock. Um, so if you're listening to it. Um, sort of on a Wednesday evening or Wednesday daytime, depending on your time zone, on the 20th of May. Chances are it's live, which is great. Um, so you can join in. Um, there's two ways of joining in at the moment, um, which is Facebook Live, where it's streaming through. Um, and also you can give me a call. Uh, my number's 07506 319 745. Thanks. 07506 319 745, I'm sure numbers will scroll on the screen or something like that at some point. Uh, if you're calling from outside of the UK, it's plus four four, uh, just lop off the first zero. So plus four four seven five oh six three one nine seven four five. It would be great to have you on the show. But if you call, the way it'll happen is you'll come through on this thing uh, and then I'll just put you on and, and we'll have a chat about it. Um, this evening I'm talking to two amazing people, once we get the second person on, um, who are not children's um, books, authors, um, out of uh, the block, as it were. They, they've fallen into, uh, into this sort of, um, uh, this area of work uh, by a sort of non-traditional route. I mean, I don't know whether there is a traditional route into being a children's author, but one thinks of J.K. Rowling and something like that, who, who wrote all those books. And I've got a friend who, who writes children's books um, for, for, in terms of science. Um, so people seem to come from various backgrounds into children's authoring. And like I say, um, I, I read this story. Do you want to tell us, um, Alex, about the story, what it's about, who the characters are, and sure. what wrote it? Yes, thanks, Noel. Thanks so much for having us. Um, the story, it's called The Big Thing, and it's a story about a little girl named B. And it's about how she learns about the pandemic, uh, what it feels like to her. And we tell it from her perspective. Uh, so it's all told from the eyes of a five-year-old girl. And she goes through a period where, frankly, she gets depressed. All of her favorite colors suddenly look gray. She doesn't really like dessert the way she used to like dessert. She misses her friends at school. She misses her grandparents. And she feels down. And eventually her teacher, uh, Miss Eva, asks her if she uh, has any idea of what a silver lining is. And she doesn't know about it. So her teacher talks her through the concept and then helps her uh, identify what are the positive aspects of how her world has changed. And the story takes the reader through her kind of self-discovery about for as difficult as this period is, there's lots of things that she feels good about. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to acknowledge uh, that children do get depressed or sad yeah. and yeah. that it's really important for their support network to help them find kind of the positives. And we want to tell it through the eyes of a little girl. So we went out and we interviewed probably a dozen five-year-olds to better understand how they see things. And the reason we have the title is because when we ask children about uh, what they viewed the pandemic to be, they can't really identify the specifics of what a disease going around the world is, but they would often say it's a big thing. Right. And so why did you get involved in, why did you become interested in wanting to write a children's book about the pandemic? What was the motivation there? Well, Angela and I um, uh, have been friends for about a decade and we're both doing a lot of writing. I wrote a, another children's book about six months ago for my daughter. 
And we were on the phone when the quarantine first started and we said, God, this is so difficult for everybody, but boy, yeah. it must be the most difficult for children because they thrive on routine. And all of a sudden, everything that's their routine uh, has been turned upside down. And we asked ourselves, what could we do? And we said, well, maybe we could write a story that would help children make sense of this period. Yeah. And you're a father yourself. Was that part of the sort of motivation for wanting to do something like this? Definitely. Yeah, my, my daughter's a little bit young still, um, but my friend's children, I think, uh, almost universally have been struggling to understand what this means. Yeah. And what about you? Were you struggling to understand it? I wonder if that was part of it. <laughs> I'm still struggling to understand it. Yeah. I mean, the, the, you think you understand it one day and then the next day you kind of don't. And it's because, you know, we're all in this, I feel this kind of um, echo chamber where news runs around and we kind of react to it, but we're still figuring out what it means. How are you experiencing the pandemic at the moment? How is it going for you and, and your family? Uh, you're in Wyoming at the moment, aren't you? Yeah, I'm in the least populated state in the United States. Um, so we've been socially distancing because that's just our normal day to day. Um, right. We see more animals than people. So it's not that hard. But my parents and my sister and my whole extended family, they live in New York City. And my parents are in their 80s. So we're obviously you know, worried about them and their health um, and our friends. Some of you're from family. New York, originally, I think, aren't you? You're, you, you, you uh, yes. did you grow up in New York. I did, yeah. And my co-author, un unfortunately, her grandmother um, got COVID and passed away from it during our story. So uh, I think it was very personal for both of us, especially for Angela. I just want to let you know, if you see me looking down, it's because I'm grabbing the iPad and I'm going on to Facebook at the same time. Okay. Uh, so that I can just look at comments and sort of uh, bring people into the conversation. Um, and uh, it's just a, one of those odd um, things about this style that we have of doing things. So it's very odd, isn't it, at the moment, how much of our life has changed um, by this experience on this practical sort of level. And actually, you know, I left out one really important point, which you just reminded me of, which is the book's for free in, in seven languages. And the reason we um, did it this way is for, for a couple of points. First, kids are all learning at home now and I can't go to the bookstore. I can't really easily get a book. So we, we thought we would distribute it um, for free. People could download it in whatever language they want and read it on their computer, on their iPad or phone or whatever. Yeah. And then we realized some people want a physical copy. So we, it's on Amazon too. And we um, donate any proceeds to yeah. UNICEF. Um, but like you say, everybody's looking at their device these days. So that's how books have to be uh, read. I mean, I, I've, I've read it. I think it's beautiful. That's why I was interested in getting you both on the show and talking about it. One of the things that strikes me is that there's a lot of thought has been gone into how a child thinks and feels and experiences things. Um, and I guess you must have done a, a lot of research. Can you tell us about that, what, what you did in terms of getting that child's view? Well, we wrote the book after a few drafts. We thought we had a pretty good pretty good story and so we started checking it out with all of our friends and their kids and mostly we were getting the reaction of that's kind of how adults would think a child um, experiences this and so we went and interviewed a lot of five-year-olds and that was <laughs> really really an eye-opener um, and yeah. we rewrote, rewrote the entire thing yeah yeah what, what, what was the sort of things that they were telling you that um, were, were... <laughs> well in our first draft um, B had a, uh, an imaginary friend who was a superhero who gave her lots of guidance. And some of the kids would say, you know, adults often think we have imaginary friends, but really we wanna see the world as it is. I mean, I'm paraphrasing maybe in my words, we wanna see the world as it is. Kind of don't talk down to us, um, talk to us like we are little people and you know, help us figure it out. And so that's what we tried to do in the, in the story. We didn't shy away from the really difficult stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's very respectfully written. Um, it isn't talking down, it's very much as a child. So, for example, um, uh, you know, children don't tell you, I'm feeling depressed. What they tell you is, I don't want my puddings anymore. That's absolutely correct. That's how you know that a five-year-old is struggling because they, they lose interest uh, in the things that they used to be interested in. And that's a classic sign of depression as well. It happens to be one of the, there's a thing called a PHQ-9, which is a scoring sheet you do to measure depression. And one of the things is losing interest in things that you used to have an interest in. 
in the past. Uh, it's a behavioural thing, and that's what you'll get from children is behavioural cues. So it, I thought it was really, really well observed. Um, I was asked to write um, a review of not just the book, but of the whole idea of um, children's stories during um, difficult events like this. And and your book was part of the um, uh, was the main part of the um, news article, um, which was I think for the Hong Kong Times or the China news. Yes, uh, South China Morning Post. South China Morning Post. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I sort of uh, it was. Um, one of the things that struck me is, and you, you just mentioned it, it doesn't shy away from the really difficult and frightening things. Um, was that a bit anxiety provoking for you to sort of be dealing with something that was potentially going to frighten children? I mean, did, did you, how did you manage to deal with that, that in terms of your thinking? Yeah, we thought a lot about that. You know, for example, do you talk about death um, yeah. for children? And, and we, we definitely, made conscious decisions not to go in that direction. What we tried to do is be respectful uh, of, of a child mind needing to understand and make sense of, of things. And it's just impossible to avoid some of the difficult subjects when you're dealing with you know, yeah. the concept of a pandemic. Yeah. So the way we would try to get at it, let me give you an example. Uh, when I went out and talked to lots of parents, I'm a parent too, I, I, I would hear a couple common things. Often I would hear that parents were telling their children, you gotta be really careful. Uh, you can't you know, injure yourself because hospitals are full. We can't take you to the hospital right now. You gotta be careful with your you know, skateboarding or your bicycling or whatever it is. And so we put in there that, that message. We actually had the main character scrape her knee and, and her dad tell her that the hospitals were too busy right now. Um, we, we wanted to not shy away from stuff, um, but not to go as far as how an adult might, you know, talk about the really scary things. Yeah, yeah. Is that, and, is that a logical way to do it, do you think? Yeah, it seemed to me, it seemed to me very appropriate because I think one of the things is that we assume a number of things about children, which I don't think are true. One is that they, they don't know as much as they actually do. So we assume children don't know very much when in fact they know an awful lot and they have many sources of information. And one of the things I'm always encouraging parents to think about is the fact that if you're not talking to your child about something, somebody else is. Whether one of their peers. It makes or, so much sense. You know, and so uh, they will be getting information. And so one thing you have to do is think about the type of information you give them. The second thing is that adults often want to protect or shield children from difficult things um, and it, it always fails always, it fails. always fails without a doubt it always fails and it always backfires and it always has unintended consequences like for example um, the classic example is sort of um, trying to shield children from death and funerals um, and uh, so not taking them to funerals for example because they think it might be too difficult for them. Uh, without a doubt, I've never come across a situation in which that has been helpful. Um, it makes sense. Is true. Well, you know, two things I think related to that um, that we tried to include in the story. The first was as adults, you know, we can actually adapt to working at home yeah. maybe more easily than we expect because we're so used to staring at screens, right? Yeah. For children, even if they're comfortable with screens nowadays, it's a much harder transition to all of a sudden school has to be on your computer. Yeah. And we, we tried to really reflect that because um, B has a hard time with that. And one of the ways she also has a hard time with it is she can't, she can't see all her friends because they're too small on her computer yeah. and she can't smell her grandparents anymore. You know, we, we, as adults, I think we sometimes forget how senses work for um, children. Yeah. Smell is a big deal. And when we would talk to children about what they miss the most, they would often say, you know, I miss my grandparents. And we'd say, well, what do you miss about not seeing them? And they'd say, I, I can't hug them. I can't smell them. Yeah. I see them on a screen, but I can't smell them. It's almost as if their world was just turned upside down. And we thought that was important to put in there too. Sorry, I'm just getting messages from James, who's the technician that people can't see in the broadcast. Um, just saying about Angela and what's happening with Angela and trying to get her in. And he's talking with her now, but she can't connect and he's trying to get her in. So at some point, Angela will join us, if that's okay, Alex. We'll just yeah, sort of, of course. Uh, get her on. It's one of those things. Um, so Can I tell that, you a little bit about Angela? Um, no, she'll come and tell us about herself when she gets okay. in. Let's just stay with her. 
um, and stay with the conversation about um, B and getting to know B and her story because I think she is a very alive character. It's a, it's quite a short book, so um, people should know that um, it doesn't take a long time to read because it shouldn't do it. Your book doesn't. Um, one of the other things that struck me about it dealing with so-called adult themes was that obviously as a book is designed to be read by a parent or carer with a child. It's not something I'm just going to give to a five-year-old and say, read, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and it's designed in that way. And one thing that struck me about it was that um, it, it's taking these big, scary themes about the pandemic and putting them into uh, what is a very loving and very not scary activity, which is reading a book with mummy or daddy, uh, was a fantastic way of making the pandemic feel safer. Yeah, we wrote this book also for parents and teachers as much as for children. Cool. They're the ones who are going to help children through this. Um, yeah. And also, you know, as a father, you know, you read so many books, right, to your children, yeah. and you read them over and over again. So ideally, you want ones that your parents, uh, that the parents can enjoy. And a big part of that was the illustrations. Um, would you like me to tell you a little bit about that? Please do. Yeah. So we have uh, our illustrators from Uruguay. Um, Angela is uh, Chinese uh, and lives now in California. And we had translators from a dozen, uh, almost a dozen countries. So it's very international. The illustrator did a phenomenal job of, of kind of magical realism. So if you look at the pictures, he intentionally designed them to be the way, say, a child might see things. Yeah. So for example, the father's beard goes all the way up to his eyes. Yeah. And that's, that's not how um, normally beards grow. But if you talk to children and they talk about their father's beard, they might actually sketch it out on a piece of paper and have the beard go all the way up to the eyes. And yeah. so this magical realism element makes an extremely difficult subject, even in words, a bit more um, kind of palatable, even yeah. the hardest stuff. Yeah. And um, what I'm going to try and do is, um, while we're talking, so again, if I seem distracted, don't worry about that. I'm going to go and try and find my copy of the big thing. Um, and then uh, maybe start showing some of it. Um, okay. Screenshots on the screen. Um, so, so let's keep talking. I, I've said right at the beginning of the introduction, you had a sort of uh, non-traditional way of coming into being um, a writer um, uh, of children's books. So maybe we could get to know a little bit about um, you and um, your background um, and um, sort of uh, because... Uh, I'm, again, you know, coming back to my early point, there's no, you know, all the all the children's authors that I know have come from a variety of backgrounds, and there's no one particular one. Um, but yours in particular seemed to me interesting in that um, uh, th there was nothing about your career that would suggest that at some point you're going to end up writing children's books about <laughs> pandemic. Um, so what was your career, um, Alex? What was, um, tell, tell us where okay. you about your background. Sure. You know, I, I just before I do that, I, I guess today we kind of assume there's a linear path for many people um, yeah. because our society has become so specialized. You know, not that long ago, people did lots of different things. Um, they didn't necessarily have you know, a perfect trajectory that made sense. So I guess mine's more in that category. Yeah. I've worked in, um, I worked in the White House for Bill Clinton. I worked um, for Bill Gates at his foundation. Um, that was interesting. And then I was in business for about 10 years. I was CEO of a public company um, and I write a lot, but mostly op-eds. Um, so I've written about a hundred op-eds. Oh, I see Angela's made it now. She's just connected. Hi. Hello, welcome back. How are you? Hi, we had a little bit of a technical difficulty there. <laughs> it's okay, don't worry about it. It's <laughs> happy with us. And um, uh, your sidekick, um, your partner in crime, Alex, been sort of manfully carrying on. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad the <laughs> brain is here now. Somewhere with this panic there in the back of his <laughs> mind. Managing to. Um, Angela, welcome. It's really, really lovely to have you on the show. So right. Angela is the other co-author of the, the book, The Big Thing. Um, that would mm -hmm. be and just introduce you to the audience. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, Angela is in um, San Francisco at the moment. And mm -hmm. um, Alex is in Wyoming and I'm in London and this is the way life is at the moment. <laughs> so we have this very uh, odd international sort of experience going on. Um, and somehow this pandemic um, has just 
it's not something that I didn't think was possible, which is really brought people together internationally in a way that I've never seen before. One thing that has struck me um, uh, during my period of time in lockdown in London um, was that how not like all those zombie films this pandemic has been. It's been the opposite experience because, of course, in all the zombie pandemic films that have existed up to this point, and even in all the non-zombie pandemic films that have existed, um, society has broken down and people have started killing each other and eating each other and getting dead. <laughs> and the absolute opposite has happened. Mm. The absolute opposite. What seems to have happened is that people have come together. Certainly in my community, and when I talk to my friends over in the US as well and around the world, um, there's been a real sense of community emerging from this. Um, mm. and, uh, and, and I was also, without getting too highfalutin about it, just thinking about the responses of many governments about it has been to reinstate the social contract between themselves and ordinary people. Mm. So we think about all these economic bailouts. Um, uh, so if you think about the 2008 uh, banking crisis, the economic bailouts bailed out. Um, the people already had lots of stuff anyway. Um, and uh, the ordinary person on the street, the ordinary Joan, Joanne on the street, didn't get very much. But this time around, it's been very, very different. So the economic bailouts, you know, the job retention schemes, et cetera, have been aimed mm. at ordinary folk uh, for good economic reasons, I think. But, um, but it's been very, very different and very mark markedly different. Uh, and mm. also uh, what we've done in this pandemic is we've protected the vulnerable. So it's, it, you know, I'm, I'm not particularly at risk from the virus. I might, if I got it, I don't know. Maybe I'd be unlucky. I'd have to be quite unlucky to have a serious reaction to it. On the whole, I'm not a high risk group. Uh, but it's been no problem at all to think, okay, I'll give up my freedom to protect people more vulnerable. And that's really what's been happening. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we as cultures and as societies, which, which again is the opposite of all these pandemic films and of all these zombie apocalypse stories. It's, it's every man for himself in those stories, but that hasn't happened. We had a ver uh, we had a version a version of this. Maybe Angela can can weigh in. But you know, we we had about six or seven people in six or seven different countries come together and and work on this really fast, never having met for no money. Um, yeah. Angela organized a lot of that. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I do. Do tell us. How did it come together in that way, Angela? Yeah, I think the most, I think you're absolutely right, Noel. I think that, you know, the ironic thing to come out of a global quarantine is actually, at least for me working on this project, a kind of communal spirit. Um, that, you know, we have um, now like almost 10 people who all have, you know, normal jobs and are living, you know, sort of for many of them living paycheck to paycheck as artists or translators or publishers. And all of them have decided to dedicate their time, um, very precious time and, and resources to creating this nonprofit project. Right. Um, and so it's, it's been, you know, a really wonderful experience. And I think whenever we go through challenges as a you know, as a, as a community, as a species, we see, you know, sort of total devastation on one side, on one end, and then complete benevolence on the other. And we've been very lucky to, to experience, you know, sort of the latter half of the spectrum there. Yeah, has, has that been your experience, not just in the project, though, in terms of your experience of the lockdown as a pandemic, where you're living, for example, in San Francisco and in Wyoming? I mean, Absolutely. I, I actually just came back right before I got on the call, because it's only 1pm here in the afternoon as you can you know clearly see but I, I just got back from um doing you know sort of my so daily social distance walk where I go to a very small nearby park and just kind of walk around for a couple of times just to get some fresh air and um a security woman at this park you know she's like has her little mask on and you know she's kind of patrolling the place and she says hello I hope you have a lovely day you know hope everyone um, in your family is safe and sound to every single person she passes and she just sort of brightens you know everyone's day who, who everyone who walks past her and I so I've seen that kind of you know just from from the sort of the details of everyday lives and people being really really kind yeah. and generous to each other yeah was that part of the motivation in wanting to write this in terms of wanting to give something that sense of altruism 
I'm a little late to the party, so I don't know if Alex kind of took you through already our story of um, why we decided to write this. Um, just a little bit, Angela. But, you should you should do the broader one. Uh, but yeah, it, it was just one day we were on the phone. We were all kind of frustrated. We were all on in lockdown, and it had only been one week, and we were already memorizing the gradient of our bedroom sunsets because we are of a privileged group who you know were able to be quarantined. I have some family members in China who, who weren't were not quarantined. Um, they still had to go to work. Um, and we were thinking about what we can do sort of to contribute to something good to this, this crisis. And um, at one point we realized that for those growing up during this crisis, um, Generation C, some are calling it, um, their lives will be profoundly altered by what happens during this period. Mm -hmm. Just like the people who grew up, you know, for example, during the financial crisis, who just graduated college from the financial crisis. And so we, write a, we wanted to write a story for them, for the children who, you know, are gonna spend one or two or even three of, 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 of their most formative years indoors, not being able to see their friends or go to the beach freely. And, and this, so we decided to write a story for them. Okay. And what was my, because you don't, you're not a parent yourself. I understand that Alex is, that you mm -hmm. have your own children. So why, why a kid's story as opposed to an adult story for you? I'm just interested in on a very personal level, really, I guess. I mean, besides the fact that we're mediocre writers, <laughs> um, and can only, you know, muster like a few words from our, from our very tiny vocabulary. Um, <laughs> we thought it was, you know, we, we were talking to our friends and, and, and our friends who have children are, you know, like our, 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 and our, our families. And it was something that we felt was, you know, children are so affected by something like this, like Alex said, because, you know, they have, uh, they thrive on routine. They thrive on stability and structure. And when something like this happens, you know, all of a sudden everyone is home. You can't go out and see your friends. Summer camp is canceled. You go to school on the internet. All of these things are disrupted. And so in a way I felt that, you know, at, at this time it's, this is the, the kind of time that forms sort of how a child deals with with important challenges in the future yeah. and so whether you know uh, there's gonna be, you know life is difficult life throws challenges at us and you know in every corner and it should because you know it's not supposed to be easy it's supposed to be worth it mm -hmm. but how we deal with those challenges is what makes us you know the people we are and so whether it's, you know, a, a divorce or a war, somebody going bankrupt or something really, really difficult happening in the family, um, children have to learn at a very early age how to deal with those difficult subjects. And this is simply one of them. Yeah. And of course, writing a children's book is uh, in terms of timeline. We wanted to get it out as soon as we could. We wanted to put sort of full throttle. Um, and of course, writing a novel would take months, if not years. And a children's book is relatively... Um, speedier. Yeah, I mean, I think the novels will come at some other point and people will have very clever thoughts about it. I mean, one thing mm -hmm. that strikes me of is that although it's a children's book, it's actually a book, uh, which is a story about something that's um, big and scary that's going on. And when we had our research chat earlier in the week, we, we I think I introduced you to the idea of um, that uh, we, one of the sort of psychological theories about how we function um, is called transactional analysis and he has this idea that we have an internal parent state, an internal adult state and an internal child state mm -hmm. um, and it's a way of thinking, it's not a neurological fact, there isn't an adult bit of your brain and a child, it doesn't work like that but it's a way of metaphorically thinking about how we've organised our psyche um, and so for me there's something about when we read a children's book and um, we're reading as the child inside ourselves and to the child inside ourselves and for mm -hmm. me I think there is something about this pandemic that pushes everybody into potentially a child state mm. in terms of the capacity to cope and bringing up child experience mm. so I think children's books uh, have um, a, a much bigger application than just the target audience is what I'm saying which is absolutely why absolutely Potter is so fantastic and so wonderful is because it, 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 it speaks about um, uh, difficult topics in an accessible manner. And I think that's another way of thinking about a children's book, that it's very, they're very clever in that they 
talk about and think about difficult topics in a very accessible way that everybody can relate to. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. Noel, um, I might be going out on a limb here a little bit because I'm not at all a trained psychiatrist or psychologist at, at all. But it strikes me that one of the challenging parts of being a child, if I can channel my inner child, is that you have no control over things. And that's one of the reasons. Uh, and the world is, you know, basically confusing. And that's as we grow up, we start to make sense of it. But when you're a little child, five years old, a lot of the comfort we derive is from the routine because we know what's going to happen or we're familiar with why something is happening. And I think the, the, the pandemic does the same thing for a child as it does for an adult now, which is as an adult, we have no more control. Like all our plans are out the window. Are we going to be able to move where we thought we were going to move? What, what, what about the job? What about our ability to be with our parents? Right, All this stuff that we took for granted. Yeah. suddenly we don't even know what tomorrow will look like yeah. and so to your point we're a lot like children now i think so i think very much so i think i, I would challenge one of one aspect of your statement which is that um, if we give a child control uh, we're actually hurting them mm. and um, there's something about a child that shouldn't have control uh, and they should be able to trust that uh, the um, trusted adults around them have that control for them, you know. Uh, and so uh, abuse of children is often giving them far too many adult things too. So, and we'd start to touch upon that theme because I think a lot of adults will be anxious about putting adult themes in a book. Now, this is a book that is dealing with really adult themes. This is a pandemic that is affecting the whole planet because that's what a pandemic is, and people are actually dying of it. And that's a courageous subject to choose for a children's book. It's not princesses and it's not seahorses. It's something real that's going on at the moment that's frightening and killing a lot of people. I mean, that's it was quite a courageous decision, I think, to decide we're going to write this book about the pandemic. I, I mean, I fully support it. I think it's brilliant, which is why I wanted to do on the show. Uh, and I, I'm just trying to, at the moment, if you see me distracted, it's because I'm messaging my team saying, have we got a copy of the book anywhere? Because I want to share it. I want to screen share it with people um, so they can see some of it because it, 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 it speaks for itself. And I think it's one of those things that does speak for itself. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, that's quite a courageous decision to choose uh, millions of people potentially dying of something as a theme for a book. I mean, it seems mad on one level, but also brilliant. I mean, why? Uh, did you, how did you get to that point? Angela, you take this one because you, you're the one who wrote the subtitle, <laughs> Brave Bia, Find Silver Linings in a Pandemic. I mean, you were really the I, inspiration. Well, first of all, I think, thank you. That's, that's, that's so very kind. And I, and I think it's, I mean, it would, I don't know. I, I'm not sure if I, I would call it brave. I think it's a topic that, that um, absolutely needs to be covered because like you said, no, it's, it's everyday life. That yeah. you know, as humans, we're extremely adaptable, and now I've I've gotten completely used to putting on a, a mask and wearing some gloves when I go outside or when I go grocery shopping. Um, so we're extremely adaptable, and and it is, you know, life as we know it at this moment in time. Um, and like I said earlier, I think that you know we have so many. There's so many challenges that life just naturally um, ha that just naturally happens to us in life, and um, how we deal with those challenges is what um, makes us who we are. True. Um, and you're both and... like my research chat, so I'm going to push you a little bit because I think <laughs> you're both a bit like this in the research chat. It's like you come up with these really interesting answers, which um, are not really getting me where I want to go. So I'm going to be a bit pushy if that's okay. All right. All right. Where, 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 where do you want to go? I'll go, I'll well, go where you want to go. I'll follow you. <laughs> Let me make it really simple. The point I'm making is that you two chose to do this and there's something about you as individuals and as friends mm. that made you want to do this and so i'm quite mm. interested in finding out what got you as individuals and as friends to the point that this not in a linear sense not in a simplistic oh well i met with my friends she thought it was a good idea and then we did <laughs> okay not in that mm. sense but what was motivating mm. you? Well, so I know, for example, Angela, that people don't know on the show, uh, that uh, you are from China and your parents came to the US, I think when mm -hmm. you were nine or something, is that right? When I was, yeah, when I was 10. Mm -hmm. 
you're 10. Um, mm -hmm. And so you're brought up in a, a, a system whereby there's only one child in a family. Um, mm -hmm. You're it. And mm -hmm. uh, so you were the hopes of the whole family, as it were, as a single child. But in a, in a culture that also mm -hmm. um, um, sort of has that imprinted on it. Um, and then there's a pandemic going on, which a, a racist chief of staff will associate with your country of origin. OK, mm -hmm. uh, and so mm -hmm. those, those types of things. So what is it that you what, what sort of things, I suppose, in, in your experience of growing up with your parents, etc., cetera, um, or your experience in life have led you to the, the thinking that you have now, which I concur with as a psychologist, I would say, you know, you have to find mm. the lining in things. Positive mm. psychology is the only way to deal with things. Positive psychology, particularly during a pandemic, is absolutely essential if you don't want to get PTSD. Um, mm -hmm. post-traumatic growth so mm -hmm. you've got all the correct um, paraphernalia Angela so well done How did mm -hmm. you learn, I guess is my question so I think like like many children uh, especially children growing up with post-cultural revolution uh, Chinese parents I have a very very complicated you know relationship with my parents and there were parts of my childhood in which I felt completely safe and unconditionally loved um, and but and there were periods in which I felt that I had to perform in order to be loved by my parents so I yeah. think there is probably a part of me that you know the message that I'm maybe unconsciously or subconsciously sending um, with this book is that um, uh, that no matter what the challenges are, if we pay attention, if we take the challenge in parts, there is, you know, always something good about it. Um, there's always a good side of, of the bad. There are always silver linings. And when doors close, other doors open. And, um, you know, I think going back to me as a kid, that's something I would have loved to know um, explicitly. Okay. that that no matter what happens you know things are going to be okay that there will be good things and bad things so my interpretation from that is that you weren't that wasn't your family culture necessarily um i'm not sure they were equipped to i'm not sure that they were equipped to to say that explicitly yeah yeah well neither were my family i mean it was sort of very much my family was um, based upon a deficit culture there was trauma um, there were inherited sure. disabilities going down many lines. My parents mm -hmm. had great parenting. They did the best job they could. I wouldn't dream mm -hmm. of criticising them. Um, and I'm, I've been lucky enough uh, in my life to have had access to um, good psychological therapies that have taught me mm -hmm. a lot, much more effective coping skills. I'm guessing, I'm, I'm interpreting from your... Um, style of talking that something similar has happened to you that you found ways in adult life of beginning to process maybe some of those deficits what sort of things have helped mm -hmm. you um, and that you'd be willing to share I guess um, and that because I think those those are the things I believe that have informed mm -hmm. who you are to the mm -hmm. point where you wrote a fantastic book about a pandemic in the middle of a pandemic for children which I think personally is a stroke of genius mm -hmm. Right. I, I absolutely do think that's a stroke of genius. Well done. And I'm fascinated by your journey and Alex's journey to that stroke of genius, because uh, I think that's really what is encapsulated in the story. Because, yes, you've got words and you've got pictures and you've got a narrative and you've got all that. But really, it's you two in mm -hmm. that. It's you two that created it and, and you created it as individuals. So it's that. So, um, so you didn't have a family which necessarily encompassed all these skills, but somehow mm -hmm. you them. So what was that story, if you don't mind sharing it with us? Again, you're, you're being very kind. Um, I think we are all sort of coping with, you know, our, our, our inner demons, our, you know, egoic mind, whatever um, you like to call it. I, I personally have tried many things to try and find uh, uh, what some people would call authentic self or peace. Some people would call it God. Um, I've, I've personally done, tried many things. Um, I've tried uh, yoga, uh, traveling, um, 
you know, like sort of uh, try to find it in personal relationships, romantic relationships. Um, I've tried to, you know, there are these workshops in which people go and try to buy enlightenment, as I'm, I'm sure you're aware of. We're like, oh, okay, you know, like three, three lessons. And, you know, I feel so much better. Everything is cured. I have so much more energy. I love my family. Um, uh, I've, you know, I, I've tried those as well. And I think what, what works a lot for me, what helps me to be present in the moment is, is a combination of, you know, meditation, um, healthy habits, maintaining great relationships with my friends and family and working on the things I love, which is something like this book. Yeah. And um, the meditation part is something that we actually try to insert into the book. Um, as you can recall, there's a part of the book in which Bia, our, our, um, our protagonist, she, she's very worried, she's very anxious. She's starting to exhibit the symptoms of some sort of mild depression. Yeah. And she speaks to her teacher um, over, you know, something like this, like a Zoom chat. And her teacher says, okay, tell me how you're feeling. And she, sp she speaks to her teacher. She tells her all of her worries um, and her sadness and her disappointments. And then the teacher says, okay, now if we pay attention, if we pay attention very, very closely, can we find a silver lining in, you know, working at home? Can we find a silver lining in um, in the current predicament? And that was sort of, I think, my way of of inserting my love of uh, of meditation into the story, which is to say, each moment taken by itself, no matter how painful, is always tolerable and is sometimes beautiful. Um, so. I'm not sure if that answers your question. No, it answers it beautifully. Um, and I think, let me describe why it answers it beautifully. Um, because I think that, um, you know, the best children's books, are uh, what mm. they do is it's almost like they do, there's a thing called timeline therapy. Mm. Uh, is a technique uh, where you ask an adult now to go back in time to a point where they were hurt or traumatized. Um, mm -hmm. And then say, well, if you could do that in your life, you could go back mm -hmm. to that frightened child that got hurt. What would mm -hmm. advice would you give to them that would mm -hmm. mean that there wouldn't be so much damage from this experience? Okay. And you can, mm -hmm. it's very effective technique and you can fly people just, just before the damage and they can give it themselves advice prior to this trip. And so I, I think there's something like that happens when an adult writes a book for children in the best children's books. Is that mm. do exactly what you just described, which is they fly back in time to that child they were that needed the advice when they needed it, and they give mm. it. Yeah, and then mm. that resonates through the narrative, that emerges yeah. through the narrative, and that's what was striking me about the book, uh, was that mm. the moments like that where I could see that there were adult authors who obviously had had difficult times, mm. okay, could empathise mm. and understand, they could write mm -hmm. a book difficult times, but also mm -hmm. could come up with solutions. Yeah, yeah. There's a part in the book where, you know, she begins to pay attention and she notices that the sky is bluer and her, you know, it's bluer than even her favourite sweater which is you know blue sweater and you know that's something that i've noticed in 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 my own life which is that you know in in times when i'm in um when i'm suffering or when i'm in a lot of pain and i wake up feeling like the world might be two sizes too small to contain all the pain we miss out on all the beautiful things like if if, if i was sad and there was an incredible waterfall with a rainbow and a unicorn in front of me i would still just ignore it and focus on the pain yeah and so that was our way of one you know of course there's also sort of the 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 um climate activism kind of angle on it in which you know she notices that because yeah. the world has stopped the sky had um, a little bit more time to become blue but, but then there's also the other aspect of why the sky is bluer it's bluer because she's noticing it it's bluer yeah. because she's paying attention and that's yeah. you know what i find is that when we really pay attention everything becomes more beautiful there's beautiful even in the dreary things because it's it's a dreary world, but it's also a beautiful that, world. That skill in particular is something that children naturally have, but when mm -hmm. they're depressed, they forget. 
like anybody, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. Kyle naturally has the capacity and the skill to focus on the here and now. That's what we're talking about, which is a, mm -hmm. a really important skill that mm -hmm. I teach adults all the time. Because mm -hmm. adults they forget this capacity to just stay in the moment and right. this moment will be okay. And they go off into the future with all the scary thoughts about economic crashes, or they go into the past with all the stuff that you can't change because it's happened. It's only in your head now. Uh, and they forget that this moment can be okay. Uh, but children are uniquely brilliant at that. And that's one of the things, and you know this, Dad, even though she's still quite young, yours, is that she's noticing everything in the moment. Mm -hmm. that yeah, yeah, please go ahead. I was just going to say one of the things that I'm struck by that yeah, is that, and every parent has experienced this, you know, if your baby falls on her head, mine's 14 months, so more of a toddler, falls on her head, she'll start to cry. And then if you, uh, you know, pick her up and point her at something interesting, she'll stop crying because she's interested in what you pointed her at. She immediately sees the present and forgets about the past. Yeah. And that's a standard technique I'll teach parents is we call it distraction. Don't, don't try and pick up a child that's really disturbed about something. Just distract them. Just mm -hmm. show them a pretty flower. Uh, and yeah. that'll work much more effectively than trying to give them a hug. Because they'll okay, just... So you, so you just hit the nail on the head of why we wrote this book. So Angela and I, friends for 10 years, sitting there talking on the phone, lamenting the state of the world a week into the quarantine. And what could we distract ourselves with that we thought would be positive and constructive? And, yeah. you know, surely there was lots of psychology in our past and the way we grew up that, you know, informed a decision or how we tackled this. But that was the main reason we did it. We wanted to see a flower. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's, that's a perfect way of describing it. I've got a couple of pictures which um, we can, James has got. Um, I'm still getting, trying to get my team to get a few more pictures from the book. I don't know if you've got a copy of the book anywhere that you can email through to James and we can go through some of the images. Have you got a copy there with you? Uh, it's really easy for James. Just go to thebigthing.org and you can download the book right there. Um, it's James, faster than emailing it. You do that, thebigthing.org. Um, but James, I want you to um, screen share the, the two images that you've got. I'm going to rewind the conversation a little bit because we were talking just before you got on with us, Angela, uh, about mm. how one of the things I love about the book is that um, uh, it, um, it describes how a child might experience something from a child's uh, perspective. Um, so not that that's the um, cover, James. Have you got the the picture of the knee being scraped? James will search through. This conversation Alex and I were talking about, about um, uh, depression in children, for example, because one of the themes in the book as it describes there we go so Alex you were talking to me about this image can you see it yep I see it so um and 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 how um sort of it's beautifully observed the fact that um you know so thinking about the dessert um she worries so much that dessert like mum's cup takes no longer tastes as sweet which is how a child will express being depressed because they'll lose interest in um, things that um, they normally had a, a lot of interest in. So I just thought that was a very beautiful um, uh, a way, and it, it shows the sort of illust the illustrations, but also the concepts. Now, a child, if you're reading that story to them and they're feeling sad and depressed, they will get that immediately. Mm. So if you're a parent and you're sitting with a child and you read this story, and then they respond to, you will know automatically in their response whether your own child is feeling depression or sadness about this thing or not as well, because of their response to that. Because a child will read that and just go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Then their, their response to it will tell you whether or not they're identifying because they're experiencing it or they're empathizing because they understand mm. that a friend is sad. Yeah, and they have other friends. Um, and then the other picture is when B falls down and scrapes her knee, her parents patch her up and tell her she needs to be extra careful because the hospitals are very busy right now. And, and which I think is a brilliant description of um, what we shouldn't be doing to children at the moment during this pandemic, is dumping our adult fears upon them uh, about this. Uh, but it's also, I think it's a beautiful illustration of something Alex was saying about um, the pictures and how they're drawn in a way that a child sees the world. So you've got this ridiculous beard on this dad. <laughs> <laughs> a no quarantine beard. beard. 
Yeah, um, but, but also no beard actually does that, does it? Except from a child's <laughs> perspective that it does absolutely do that and the child will pick out certain aspects and features. So I wanted to show that. Thanks, James, that's enough of that. If you get some other images, James, let us know um, once you've downloaded the book and uh, then he'll message me, James will message me once he's downloaded the book and we can go through um, some more of the images. I particularly want to show some of the things that we've been talking about just now, Angela, about the moment of mindfulness and meditation mm -hmm. uh, as well. Um, and you were saying, Alex, that part of your motivation for writing this was to be able to distract yourself, as it were, with this flower. Um, because uh, you've been feeling some anxieties and fears and a bit of difficulty in getting into the moment, as it were, and sort of, um, so tell us about that. What's, I guess, your experience of the lockdown a bit more and what's going on for you? Okay. Um, well, for me, I, I, I've been working in business for the last decade and, and working really long hours and striving for, you know, success in a high pressure environment. And then when we had our baby, we decided to take a, some time off. So we moved out here to Wyoming and been full-time parents. And I was about to go back to work, I thought, um, when the pandemic came. And so like many people, I feel a lot of uncertainty around what the future could look like um, for me personally. You know, will I get a job? Should I do something like I was doing before? Is this not a call to action to do something that maybe is more meaningful? And so when Angela was her idea, I came up with this idea to write this book to be, you know, really candid. It was like, yes, this is something that I can do in the here and now that will bring me real satisfaction and be positive. And I can, you know, get behind a hundred percent. Like there was nothing about it that was a rationalization. Yeah. I wasn't trying to say this is worth doing. It was just a pure, wonderful thing we, we wanted to do as longtime friends, you know, and that was half of it. Like working with somebody you really, care about, which I do for Angela, is a really lovely way when you're feeling uncertain to, I guess, do something where you have a little bit of, you know, positive, constructive kind of momentum <laughs> or something. And one of the things that really is interesting that strikes me about both of you, and I know a little bit about your backgrounds, we've heard a bit about um, yours, Alex, in terms of, you know, mm -hmm. having worked with um, the president, having been a very sort of high echelons of society. Um, Angela, you also have been a very, very much a high performer in life, haven't you? Um, you've been a, a incredibly successful in your uh, previous career. Is it a previous career now um, in finance, for example? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I, I worked in finance, yes. But you were also very successful. I mean, I, I know you're a little bit reticent about talking about it. Alex will probably tell. <laughs> I can talk about it <laughs> for her. Because you, I know you won't, Angela. You'll just go, yeah, it was fine, whatever. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. So Alex, Alex, she was very successful, right? Oh, yeah, it's total superstar. Yeah, and so she was working for what sort of company? Uh, one of the <laughs> top investment banks in the world, and yeah, doing great. And she got into this, you know, not because, um, uh, but just because she's a very talented person and she's sold herself. So, so both of you have been these incredibly driven people in one sense. Um, and you've come to a point in your life, uh, it seems to me, both of you, where um, those types of motivations and drives are up for question for you. That, that is no longer particularly satisfying. And somehow you then got into writing children's books, which I think some of your friends think you're absolutely insane, don't they? <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, they do. <laughs> Angela, bit. why don't you talk about that? <laughs> um, I, I, I think Alex's career is definitely more decorated than mine, but I've been lucky enough to try um, my hand at a few things. I, I worked in journalism and, and then I worked in investment banking. Um, and, you know, I think, no, you, you and your audience know about this better than better than anyone that, you know, the, the ego always sort of operates from a sense of lack. You're always sort of lacking something. You're always sort of um, trying to fulfill this, this void, which is, you know, actually abysmal, but it doesn't, it, we don't know it. And so um, I think there's, um, 
there are many ways to filling this void and 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 the one that i have often chosen in my life is is with achievement and with um an ability to maybe be impressive to 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 people to people in my family even um but every time you achieve what you think is you know should be the ultimate thing that 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 you know sort of turns everything around that makes you feel whole um another sense of lack sort of comes in and yeah. you sort of start to realize that all of those things none of those things in fact will fill the void because the void is is inside you and it's an abysmal void and the only way to really um fill it is to find your center is to you know in as cliche as this is going to sound to to be yourself and to to accept yourself self acceptance is is self love and so i think i was first of all very lucky to to be able to try a, a few different careers um i started working when i was 16 years old i moved to paris on like a modeling contract and so from 16 until now i'm 29 now for 13 years that i was you know a a, a tax payer um I was trying to look for something that was always there and the minute that I realized it was always there and that my job was to to go and cultivate it um everything kind of made sense all at once and it's something that I of course still struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis um but I kind of have a compass now to 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 find it I I know where it is and um it's not in finance and it's not in um you know uh money or status or fame or any of number of things that i think um are to many people very worthy pursuits but it's in in fact in embracing um who i am and what i naturally love to do and that's not an easy thing to do embracing oneself Yeah, um I think it's the most difficult thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. And potentially it's the most beautiful it's it's the most difficult thing I've done so far. Yeah. And I'm still doing it and I'll probably do it until the day I die. Yeah. And like well let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> once you've once you've done the difficult task of finding out who you are and then you go on and do it on purpose, losing mm -hmm. that is um uh, particularly painful. Um I can tell you having met people who have then subsequently mm -hmm. given up on themselves um it, mm -hmm. it's a particularly painful decision to do that so i wouldn't if i was your mm. advice you do that uh, but what's interesting is that once we get into an authentic relationship to ourselves um uh, we mm. then don't really know where it's going to go is the truth mm -hmm. it, it's so mm -hmm. it's it's got a life of its own <clears throat> very much so and what it's making me think of is that Uh, most people know about the concept of karma and then they have this sort of weird concept that karma is you're going to get your just deserts what what you deserve or some i don't know some weird um, but actually karma goes with a concept called dharma and karma essentially means something like um comfortableness with yourself and happiness with with uh, yourself and the way that you are you so that you don't have to be um sort of reincarnated just to learn life lessons you've learned life lessons and the reason mm. you've learned life lessons is because um you've accepted your dharma and dharma is meaning or purpose mm. so we discover our meaning and purpose and we accept it and then our karma is great that's essentially the lesson of karma and dharma it mm. seems to me that you've gone some way and both of you've gone some way to this dharmic thing discovering your meaning and purpose um and then whatever you do and the theory of dharma goes like this whatever you then do as long as you're in touch with your meaning and purpose it's going to be fine you're going to be okay you're going to feel okay so don't worry about it too much your karma will be fine so you can chill and all of that sort of stuff um and both yeah. of you have come to some sort of dharmic understanding of yourselves it seems to me alex yeah. what you're looking like you want to jump in there somehow um i was more wondering if i've actually gotten that far <laughs> um i kind of agree with angela that it's a lifelong 
journey. I guess what I've done, I don't want to claim I've reached any kind of enlightenment about these, these points, but I guess what I've done is known enough to step off the track of something that wasn't leading me there and to um, try to figure out what would be more um, in sync with, I guess, my soul. And I do love to write and I love to help other people. And so, you know, a very small thing we could do was to do this children's book. Um, yeah. I think I mentioned I wrote another one. I wrote that for, for my daughter, really, when she was born, because I wanted, we spent like years trying to have a baby and went through a lot of difficult periods. And I wanted to tell her her story in a way that when she was, you know, old enough to be able to um, start to piece it together would be um, a lovely way to tell her about her past. So, so that both these, have been for me very personal um, and sincere experiences, maybe the most of the things I've done for a long time. Yeah, and they, so I think the theme of authenticity is coming through in that. There's something about, again, coming back to children, uh, and the sort of why I'm going off on these tangents is because uh, what I do, that's what I did, <laughs> sort of um, hazard of being in my profession, that I, I follow these sort of tangents. But, but secondly, I know that because um, we've got the very serious important task of promoting this book. Okay, and I think it should be promoted because I think it needs to be read very wide, widely. Um, and so we're going to be working with you here in the UK, trying to get it uh, as wide an audience as possible. Um, but I wouldn't be promoting it so much if um, you two were not uh, involved with it. Um, because um, this this is a book that you two have written from your souls, if I don't sound a bit too highfalutin, um, and that the essence of who you are and your experience in life is somehow in this book, and that I think part of, I don't know, I'm guessing here, I think part of the motivation of wanting to write it um, is because you've both struggled in life, um, and that you want to, and you've got some insight into um, how to stop that, pointless struggle, uh, which is stuck, struggle against reality and truth and the truth of yourself is a waste of time and it will just cause a lot of pain. And you've got some insights, genuine, hard earned insights, uh, which I think you put in the book uh, and, it, and it comes across very strongly. So when I'm going off on these tangents, it's really because I want people who are listening and watching to understand um, how genuine you two are and how safe their children are in reading this book because you've brought your struggles and your understanding, your knowledge into it. And so if they, if a parent sits down and reads this book with their kids, they're reading um, the wisdom of both of you. And it's, and wisdom uh, is not age and anything like that. Wisdom is I've learned life's lessons. So I've incorporated life's lessons and I've allowed them to change me uh, and make me wise. That's what wisdom is. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in the book. So that's why I'm going off the tangents, not to um, stop you promoting the book, but I think you, the, the, the book is best promoted by understanding you too. It's um, very kind of you to, to articulate it that way. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I think you're being very generous. Um, when we were having our um, our sort of introductory chat as we just met only a few days ago, um, I think we discussed something like, you know, the opposite of, of addiction is connection. Yeah. And the opposite of pain is love. And so I think, you know, like we don't have a word for, you know, sort of the opposite of, of, of loneliness or of despair or of the anxiousness and confusion and the, the seduction of, of despair during this period. But if we had a word for it, that's, you know, the word I would probably use to describe like where the spirit of this book sort of came from yeah. is connection and love and all of these wonderful things that, you know, make sort of this place um, a coherent whole that is, you know, what we yearn for and what we long for and why, you know, like you said earlier, why I read Dr. Seuss's books and he says, no one can be youer than you. And it still touches me in places that I never knew existed. Yes. And every time I read it, it's it's a new dimension of what that means. Yes. So, yes. And, and I think because he puts so much love and care and grace into those words. Um, and um, that's the same place that I think we wrote this book from. Yeah. 
Um, okay, we've got some pages now. James has got the book downloaded. Um, so what I'd like to do is maybe start doing some screenshots of some of the pages and we can just scroll through and then talk about them. And then what you've just um, talked about, Angela, will shine through, which is the um, care and love that you've put into it um, will become apparent. So James, if you just start at the beginning and start scrolling through the book um, and then myself, um, um, Alex or Angela will just say stop at various points and we can begin to start talking um, about um, some of the images and some of the concepts. So here we are. Yeah, so even in the first page, you know, um, we had this, uh, we worked with a brilliant il illustrator and a friend of ours from Uruguay, you know, talking about <laughs> collaboration uh, between continents. And what he wanted to do was he wanted to angle um, the uh, sort of the, the street so that it would be a child sort of looking yeah. up at the street around her. And so, you know, the closed signs and, and, and the people walking around with their masks on, they look so much larger than life because as a kid, you know, everything just looks so huge. Um, and that's, you know, part of the reason why it can be sort of daunting is that it's yeah. so big. And what strikes me about it as well, I've talked about the theme that we've been talking about, is that in mm. some we're all pushed into that pers perspective at the moment. And That's right. The, the book captures it in this opening scene, but actually it's a real experience for all of us that this big thing mm. is really big um, and it's pushing yeah. us all into a space in which we feel quite small. So if you scroll up a bit more, James, this is great. No, I mean, to the next page. Yeah, this, this page, we spent a long time on Angela and I on the words. I mean, first of all, the thing on a children's book is it's only about a thousand words usually. So every word really matters. And, you know, on this one, um, if you, if you see, can you scroll down a little bit more, James? I want to show it towards the bottom of the page. Um, you'll, you, you'll see the text. It says for thousands of years, this virus lived in bats. The bats learned to live with the virus and now scroll up again. It says, one day the virus jumped onto a man and he became very sick. So Angela uh, did a lot of thinking on this word jumped. We were trying to figure out how do you come up with a word to explain how a virus goes from one person to another? Yeah. That's a complicated concept. What is a word that would work for a child? So the word jumped was one that we felt children could relate to. And yeah. as we talked to them, they understood that. But you'll see in this picture, we've got a cityscape that could be any city in the world, which was intentional, whether it's Beijing or New York or San Paolo. And we've got the virus coming out of a person. You can see he's coughing and it's going yeah. all around. And you've got the big COVID um, kind of image up in the top left, almost like a sun and then smaller yeah. ones. <laughs> this is a bit of a scary picture. And yeah, it, it's it, a bit dark. You know, we, we wanted to really be clear that you know, this is a complicated and scary subject, but it's also one that we can manage our way through. And so we didn't shy away from trying to, to, to do that. Yeah. And again, I would validate that because I think that otherwise what you do is you're saying to a child that uh, their experience and their fears are somehow diminished and not real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so I think mm -hmm. it is important to capture something of the actual reality of the fear that that's going on. So, mm -hmm. Okay, keep going, Jane. And then keep going. I think we'll just keep going a little bit. So we're hearing Beth B here, what she likes to do. Um, yeah, and we wanted to make her, you know, a, a very, she's a very sort of precocious, um, um, a very brave little girl. And, you know, she doesn't like the usual sort of, you know, she's not thinking about like wearing a skirt or dressing up as a princess. She's a very adventurous. She wants to go and catch baby crabs and build sandcastles. You know, yeah. she has her own dominion. Um, and um, some of that has been taken away from her because of, of, of this, um, this pandemic. And then we get that plastic line, I think, which um, we talked about Alex, is she can't smell them or hug them, her grandparents. Um, mm -hmm. it's, again, it's precisely how a child would experience loss. Um, and mm -hmm. it's 
you know, we would imagine they lose certain types of things, but actually no, those are the things that they miss is the smell um, and the feel, the kinetic feel. Mm. If I go back into mm. my child, I remember well, my mum died many, many years ago, but I can still remember the kinetic feel of her and being in mm. her arms and the smell, those things stay with us. And we know yeah. that neurologically those things stay with us. And when, for example, we have neurological brain disorders, smell is one of the things that can still bring back memory and so we use mm -hmm. therapy with people that have neurological disorders That's right. these are very powerful and primal experiences keep going james <clears throat> and some more details of what she liked so we're getting a sense of the loss uh, of her favorite things and then we see the image that we've seen before of um, the cupcake and her possibly being depressed and, uh, and dad being too adult with her and not getting into her world as much. Um, and then the only the big thing. And then comes this classic moment, I think, that uh, when she starts to talk to the teacher, um, who is the adult that can sort of enter into her world and understand what her needs are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Safe adult, uh, Mrs. Eva. Uh, and Mrs. Eva, she listens quietly and she asks Bea, um, if we pay attention to your worries, if we observe them closely, we can still, can we still find um, a silver lining? And a silver lining, Mrs. Eva says, is a good sign of something that looks bad. Um, uh, and B answers, wherever their feelings, Mrs. Eva said, there are good feelings too. Yes, B answers. She often wishes she could ask her parents questions. Um, uh, but they are not around. Now she asks them questions all day long. So she... Bea then, from that idea, discovers what are the things that she's gained mm -hmm. from experience, as well as the losses. And that is mm -hmm. a key moment in the story. I think that's a, sort of enough sharing of the um, screen sharing. I wanted people to see that and see the way it's written, because it is so beautifully done. Yeah? I just wanted, wanted to say that when I've talked to my friends throughout this um, quarantine period, almost universally the positive that everybody comments on is um, the amount of time they get to spend with people they love mm -hmm. if they live with them yeah. and, mm -hmm. and or how they've reached out to people they haven't been in touch with. And yeah. Angela, when, when we were writing this, she said a couple times, we have to get across the message that nobody can do this alone. We, we need the community behind us to help us. And so for B, it's her teacher, uh, it's her parents. Right. She gets to ask her parents questions all day long. That's great for a child, maybe not for a parent, but it's great for a child. Yeah, yeah, no, it's fantastic. I mean, there's a, there are many really positive um, things that are happening in this book, which are, I think um, should go across. And I want to circle back to something I said earlier on, um, which is one of the most positive things about this book is that mm -hmm. difficult, dangerous subjects. I mean, it's placing them in the context of something that is inherently safe, which is sitting with your mum and dad and reading a story. That activity in itself um, is inherently a safe activity. And by doing that, what we do, and again, for any parents who might be anxious about, you know, um, sitting and reading a book about the virus while the virus is going on, um, is that what that does is that it makes this uh, big, scary thing safe because mm. what's basically safe in life, and I think the story the teacher tells us this, um, is that when, when, a rela um, when we're engaged in an understandable relationship with somebody that we trust as a child, mm. whatever it is that we're dealing with becomes manageable because the relationship contains it. Yeah. That's what happens yeah. with the teacher, that the teacher contains all these fears um, and in the relationship to the child, allows the child then to contain the experience. Yeah. And that's what yeah. we'll do as a parent if we sit down and read this book with our children who may be frightened or depressed about what's going on. Uh, it's the, the fact of the strength of our relationship to them uh, will allow the child to process these things, these big scary things, uh, and feel okay. Mm -hmm. As well as mm -hmm. uh, some another technical point about narrative structures. Narrative structures in themselves uh, allow us to process difficult things and come through them because they, they have a, a beginning, a middle, and end, a resolution. Sure. There's yeah. that narrative structure is there, and with that resolution, uh, we have the catharsis of the um, scary stuff happening, 
we get through it, yeah. and then we have the mm -hmm. resolution. And that narrative structure, beginning, middle, and end, allows mm -hmm. every human being um, in, in a narrative culture to be able to process something. So there's lots of things psychologically, lots of mature things happening there. Um, and it, it was interesting, I thought, that you chose a five-year-old. Um, because because of this thing, I think there's so many levels on which uh, that works therapeutically. Have we lost Angela? I think she's frozen. No, she's back with us. Okay. Um, Am I frozen? No, no you're back. You're back. Um, so uh, we've got about 15 minutes left, which gives us plenty of time. But I'm interested in yep. why five years old as opposed to 15 or yeah. what was the intuitive thinking behind that? Mm. I think it was. I think it was kind of a a a, a natural um, decision that that we made, which is you know, five years old is is kind of in the zone. And I, I'm by no means an expert on this, but like five years old is is in a zone in which children, uh, at least from friends, uh, my friends' children, are starting to ask questions like, "What is death?" Am I going to die someday? Is that tree over there going to die someday? And it's a period in which they start to understand some of these difficult subjects. They're starting to come out of this kind of blissful, um, completely, you know, kind of uh, happy, um, uh, naive, kind of this, this, this precious place. And then they're coming into a world that they realize is a little bit more complicated than they, than they initially thought. Um, and so, and, and it's also, you know, the period in which, you know, they're, they're, they're absorbing so much information from the world around them um, about who their parents are, who they are, what their favorite toys means to them, about all of the things that they love that they will tell you about to represent their individuality, right? Like, I am a little girl who doesn't love the color pink, I love the color green. That says something about me as an individual. Yeah. And so we kind of felt like that was the right age to sort of place, but it's still, like you said, still a very, very safe place. It's still a place in which if, if her mother um, came into the room and said, everything will be okay, she'll believe her. Yeah. Whereas, you know, when we become adults and my, and I'm having a bad day and, you know, someone I love says it'll be okay. There's a part of me that is very, as too cynical to just accept that at face value now, you know, but at, at five years old, I think they're still very much able to, feel protected by the love and 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 you know the safety net around them yeah and so yeah. in some ways i suppose that speaks to that vulnerability in all of us or that need mm -hmm. us to have somebody um to believe again that somebody can say that it's okay yeah okay. yeah there is something going on i think in in terms of the um the lockdown and being pushed into our homes um and yeah like a bang um, our politicians making decisions, which is, I think there's a very interesting dynamic going on. Um, and it's, it's maybe slightly different in our countries, but I think there's some similarities still. Mm. Something yes. About, yeah, I mean, because I think the US has this sort of um, very vibrant individuality culture. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's very much part of your culture that mm -hmm. people should challenge individually. Mm -hmm going on uh, and mm -hmm. it's not much in the UK culture um, in the UK culture we're much more used to standing in a queue and just going well that's what you do um, whereas you might challenge it a bit more in the US um, but I think you know there is this thing of governments around the world um, saying to us well look um, we're going to make decisions for you that you have been making for yourself up till now like going out going to work yeah etc yeah and so inevitably that's yeah. a parent-child relationship. Inevitably, yeah. that's a parent-child relationship because that's what a sure. parent is a child. Yeah, sure. and, and what's so important about that is trust. It's what both of you just said. So Angela said, you know, at a five-year-old, you trust your parent, whatever she says. I think in the United States, what at least I'm experiencing is um, in some states, because we are the United States, we're different states, and really the governors have taken the parental role. Um, yeah. And if I think about maybe the best example of this, in New York State, hardest hit, the governor there, Andrew Cuomo, his daily press conferences were watched across the country by you know probably a third of the country, I'm guessing, because he was yeah. so much like what you want a parent to be in a crisis, yeah. which is he was comforting, he was knowledgeable, um, and he was clear. And you left those feeling confident that the person in charge, your parent, 
was doing the right things. Yeah. Yeah. You're nodding away there, Angela. Is that similar to <laughs> you? Yeah, I think we've been, um, you know, in the state of California, um, we've been fortunate enough to have a, another surrogate parent. Um, um, because at the federal level, you know, we're not exactly sure where our parents are saying. Um, so at the state level, we've been very fortunate to have, you know, uh, parents that are, are very, have been very, very careful, um, have been um, very diligent with their efforts to try and protect, you know, the vulnerable and, and the young, uh, sorry, excuse me, the old. Um, yeah. I mean, I, you know, with antidates at the federal level, you have somebody who's highly dysfunctional. Um, and, you know, if if I was, you know, still in social services and that was actually a parent of a child, you know, I'd be yeah. looking at prevention, to be honest. Um, so, I mean, I think that's that's quite clear. Um, but yes, I, I, I get it that the different states have responded in different ways. And, and certainly there has been, from our perspective, um, my perspective, um, looking at the response of California and looking at the response of New York has felt closer to home in terms mm. of response that we've had um, mm. uh, is to sort of very much take that role. And I guess the point I um, wanted to make about having a children's book at this moment and why it might resonate and why five seems to make uh, intuitively um, a correct thing is that um, because around the globe, we are being pushed into that child space, mm. not just emotionally, yeah. because it's so big and frightening, but because I've yeah. got have done that. And our government has yeah. in and made parental decisions and they continue to make parental decisions. Um, and we need them to make parental decisions because this thing is far too big. Mm. Otherwise, it can't yeah. be dealt with in reality. It can't be dealt with on any other level. And one would hope, yeah. this is my hope, that we get transnational sort of uh, responses soon um, and there's something I think about your book um, which it picks up on that zeitgeist that we're all looking at the moment for good parenting um, because mm -hmm. it's possible because we are literally children in the face of this huge global thing I mean I there's no way I can deal with we tried to, it was, again, most of the good ideas here came from Angela, it really did. We tried to come up Not with names. It's true. We tried to come up with names that would work in many different cultures. So names that were not long, B. Um, names that would work in Latin America as easily as they'd work in California or maybe in China. And the other goal was to make the images um, agnostic to any part of the world. So the cityscapes could be anywhere. You know, we have it in Chinese and in all the languages in Europe and in Portuguese and Spanish. And intentionally, this was our little way of saying this is a transnational issue and children are going to be experiencing it in very similar ways in whatever country they're in. So how could you tell it in a way that everyone could relate to? And if we take the metaphor of child, because we are all children <laughs> dealing with this thing, like, you mm -hmm. know, in some ways quite literally. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's why, you know, it's quite important. And that's why, you know, I think it's really important to get this thing out there um, because mm -hmm. I think it is speaking on all those levels. Um, and also, I mean, I think there is something about both of you in that you, um, again, you're very, um, to a British audience, you're going to be much more recognisable in some ways because of your self-deprecating manner. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> We can wait in lines too. We're pretty good at that. <laughs> uh, but actually, the point I'm making is that um, the, there's a, a lot of um, life experience and wisdom from both of you that has gone into creating uh, what on the surface looks like a, a, a very um, simple um, uh, thing. And of course, it's not simple at all. Um, Einstein said it yeah. very, very clearly. And he actually named as five yeah. uh, as the mm. eight. If you can explain a complex subject to a five-year-old, you bloody well know That's that. That's right. Um, yeah. One of the most intelligent people on the planet saying that. Um, and that's the truth. And I think that you have explained mm -hmm. this thing well to a five-year-old, which tells me that somehow you bloody well understand what's going on at the moment. And maybe not on a cognitive intellectual level, you're not epidemiologists, you're not experts on viruses, but you're- Pathogens, yeah. Exactly, but you are experts on your own selves, it seems to me. 
and that's what you've brought into play here. Um, and that's the nicest compliment you could give us Noel. Or yeah it was so deep it was like going all like all the way going back to Socratic like freedom and self-mastery stuff very very deep but it's the truth and I think <laughs> it's the truth that um, sort of excellence uh, involves um, personal life journeys one thing is I've always I, I was you know very excited about it, um, because I, I get all these things my PR company are great um, 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 uh, Teresa from Love PR. I better name them, otherwise she'll beat the crap out of me next time she meets. <laughs> um, uh, they're great at getting me loads of things to do on uh, news media, and and and, and I, you know, you, I'm busy. I do these things, and I go knowledge, tuck it onto the email. Um, but this was one of the few ones I stopped and went, oh wow, this has really captured me. Hmm. Which is why I said to them that, you know, I want to meet them, let's get them on the show and let's talk about this because I really, really enjoyed um, uh, writing the review uh, and I was really inspired because I thought it, uh, it was a well put together children's book. And a well put together children's book is a well put together human book. It's a well put together human experience book mm -hmm. because, as I say, and as somebody much more clever than me, Einstein said, if you can explain. Uh, complex big subjects to a five-year-old uh, you've really wrapped your head around it well um, and I would encourage um, everybody um, who comes across this book uh, to download a copy it's free um, you can get it on the website um, www.thebigthing.org mm -hmm. it's on the page uh, we'll put it out on the um, uh, when it goes out the podcast and all the information so that you can get it. Um, and then we're going to be working with these two amazing people um, at trying to get some press coverage here in the UK because I think um, uh, if we can get this out there, this is the time for it to go out there. Um, and it'll be uh, you know a book for our times. I think people look back and then go, wow. Uh, those people. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left um, and um, uh, that's the plug done uh, and um, I just wanted to do a couple of minutes just to wind down and talk about what sort of things that are you thinking possibly of doing next uh, this uh, dynamic duo uh, that are here <laughs> with me on the Zoom <laughs> what are your next plans do you think just you know I'm probably gonna go and make a snack after this <laughs> and um <laughs> I have this book in front of me that I've been meaning to read called The Sympathizer um, and uh, do some work. And, um, you know, that's as far as I've gone. That's that's as far as I can go <laughs> in terms of uh, As usual, Angela is being overly self-deprecating. Um, I'm, I'm personally going to go walk my dog. I've got a big red lab. Oh. He's been sitting outside here. You're so much the, more uh, ambitious. Last hour. <laughs> No, what I was going to say is I, yesterday while walking the dog, I did speak to Angela and I said, God, the best part about this was working with you. Can we do something else? Um, and so I'm trying yeah. to convince her, trying to convince her for our next writing project, but it's still to be determined what that might be. But you have no, we can't get a sneak preview then. Oh, <laughs> I don't that. think we know. Do you know, Angela? I don't know what it is yet. I mean, we both have our own personal um, websites, which publishes, you know, all the works. I, Alex writes, you know, an op-ed for for some something important every week. So I'm okay. sure you, that some, you know, you can follow him on his own website. And yeah. So tell us Alex's website because he will never tell us. So Angela, you tell us as Alex's website, and then um, uh, Alex will tell us your website. I think it's alexanderfriedman.com. Is that right? Um, no, it's it's. Uh, it's actually alexfriedman.org, O-R-G. That org, okay. Yeah, we give away all uh, the books, all the profits. But I mean, actually what I do is I founded something called Jackson Hole Economics, which is a free resource for people um, with kind of opinion views from some thoughtful folks from around the world about pressing problems. And the motto of it is ideas should be free because everything's behind paywalls now. And so if you're interested, it's um, jheconomics.org. Dot com and we set it up here in Wyoming because this is the biggest intact ecosystem in the United States. And our view was that so many of the problems that we face today as a kind of species come from not having appreciated the commons or put the other way, the tragedy of the commons where we've all been trying to pursue our own interests at the expense of others. And so 
the goal yeah. was to try to create a, a forum for thinking where we were looking at um, ideas from a more sustainable perspective. Um, so I do a lot of work for that, but it's right. what I really like to do is another project with Angela, if I can convince her. I'm sure we're going to put loads of pressure on her, make sure you do. So it's um, jheconomics.com. Yeah, oh. JH Economics. Yeah. Just spell economics for me because my spelling is dreadful. Oh, uh, E C O N O M I C S. Or I have the same stuff on my own. It's alexfriedman.org, uh, F R I E D M A N. I'll just put that up there. And um, um, Angela, tell us your uh, website where we can find more about you. <laughs> Oh, I, I have a little website that I've only just started to post some of my writing, um, some of my personal writing, which I think I sent one or two to you the other day. Um, it's just Angela.xyz. Angela.xyz. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a new, um, um, yeah, the new, it's like a new domain. Um, that is. Uh, yeah. That's very cool. People are doing XYZ. We're, we're going all the way to xyz now uh, okay i'm just going to put that in the um, chat as well so that people can um go and find out about you more um and i'll just that's a hard there we go angela Ming. and for anyone who wants to um you know give us suggestions for our book which we're you know doing for free and whatever proceeds we get from the print version, um, we'll go to UNICEF USA here. Um, they can email us and uh, all of our contact information for the team is on the website, thebigthing.org. And we've got the website already in the chat. Um, it's such a joy to have you on the show. Um, really, really uh, uh, a real pleasure, actually. Uh, a great book, a great project. I do hope you produce another book. Um, and maybe one of the things that the sort of listeners and viewers uh, could think of is what their next project might be. What could they take on apart from sort of downhill after a pandemic? Once you've sort of <laughs> what's yeah. left to do, I don't know. Um, but I'm That's... sure you'll think of something. Uh, <laughs> but it's really, really lovely to have you both on the show. Um, a great evening talking. Thank you very much, Noel. Uh, Thank you. You've been so generous. I we really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, look, it's it's uh, yeah, maybe it's generosity, but it's not. I, I think um, it's um, I, I'm sort of I'm very, very committed to the idea of good mental health. Um, and I see this book as being part of a really good mental health. I can't promote it enough, to be honest. So, uh, you know, I, I think it will have a, you know, really, really helpful impact on children who read it and parents who read it. Um, it's a, a really good resource, um, it, it, partly because it's, you know, it's a fun story to read. It's a, they've got that narrative structure. To, to, it's clever because you two are clever. And so you put yourselves into it. Um, and uh, it's not trying to explain the stuff which is what the, all the other books I've read on the pandemic for children is at the moment is, is trying to explain what it is and I don't think kids need an explanation of what it is necessarily uh, what they need is a bloody good story um, that will help them process it and I think in this book that, that's, that's what they've got um, and so I think we should get it out there so maybe it's generosity uh, maybe it is uh, maybe I'm just self-deprecating like you two are who knows well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the pleasure of speaking with you. Stay with me because we're going to go offline, but you two stay with me. So James, I think that's the end of the show. So if you want to cut us off um, and thanks everybody. Uh, I can't remember who we've got on next week. Um, somebody. Um, uh, <laughs> see you next week with another uh, amazing person. Bye-bye for now.